Evening, everybody. Good to see you tonight. We're so thankful you're here. What a blessing it is. I wish I could say I see all of your smiling faces, but I see more masks than I do faces. But it's good to see your smiles, the smiles of your eyes. We welcome you to our worship and witness evening service. And for those of you online, we're very thankful to have you here, and we trust that you enjoy your time with us as well. Uh, several important announcements I need to make tonight. First of all, one of our dear church family Mary's, uh, members, Larry Somers, has gone home to be with the Lord. He went home earlier today, and so we pray for the family. As of yet, we do not have firm word on when his uh, graveside service will be, but uh, we hope to know uh, either tomorrow or Tuesday but I just make you aware that, that Larry Somers is home with the Lord. One of our 100-year-old people here at TFB, and uh, we had the privilege of celebrating his 100th not that long ago. Tomorrow, I was going to say it's my privilege to have knee surgery. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's really my privilege, but tomorrow... <laughs> I'm going to have knee surgery. I have the left one done, and then, Lord willing, I'll have the right one done at the first of the year. So I'm going to be gone for three Sundays, but we have the privilege of having three wonderful men fill in for me. Jeremy, our junior high uh, pastor, will be with us. He'll be speaking next Sunday night. Then on the first Sunday of October, can you believe it, October? Harry Edwards, uh, one who's he and his family have been coming for o over a year now. And uh, some of you may not know them, but they're real sweet people. Harry will be bringing God's word to us. And on the 10th, we're not quite sure. Pastor Jared was going to preach for us and still might. But we are thinking that we might have the Bonner Singers with us on, on that second Sunday night of October. So it's either Pastor Jared or the Bonner Singers on the second Sunday night of October. And by God's grace, I'm back with you uh, on Sunday uh, in the morning and, and in the evening. And so we're looking forward to these next three weeks. I know you'll support all of those that are here in my place. We deeply appreciate that. We also just make known to you that our Wednesday night uh, dinners. We have a wonderful time having all of you come. And I know, how many of you like to eat? Oh, that's almost 100%. We, uh, <laughs> we have a wonderful time of food and fellowship, and then the children have their ministries, the youth, and then Pastor Jared leads a Bible study. So that's this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. Well, let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for your grace to us. We thank you for the way that you minister to our lives. Lord, we know we don't deserve it, and that's the wonder of your grace. It's undeserved. And so we come to you tonight, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your great love and grace to us. We do pray for the family of Larry Somers. We know that uh, uh, it's always a difficult time. He lived a long, fruitful life. And uh, we thank you for Larry. He was a blessing to us all these years. And so we are thankful that he's with you. And we pray for the family that as we have the service, that as they hear your word, they will be encouraged and, and brought to you. We thank you now for tonight's service. I pray for all who have a part. Grant them your blessing, Father God. May our uh, singing be joyous, and we give you praise, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen. And we're going to pray for Raj right now, too, for tomorrow, okay? So join me, please, as we lift this awesome guy up <laughs> to the Lord. Father, we thank you so much that, um, that you have just blessed us with Raj and Joyce and, and just the, the love that they have. Um, it is definitely a testimony of the work of grace and love in their lives that they're able to pour out so much to us. So, And I know that Raj would definitely say that same thing, that it's because you first loved them. Mm -hmm. and, 
And Lord, we, we just want to show our love to him now by lifting him up in prayer, and, and especially as he faces tomorrow. We just pray that everything would go smoothly. You would be with the surgeon's hands, that they would work skillfully, and that his recovery time would be short, that he could be back to us and do what he wants to do to serve you, to, to preach your word, to, to share in, in prayer and in, and in care ministry um, with our church family. So Lord, bless him and Joyce and, and keep them close to your heart, Lord, and, and remove any kind of nerves that he might have and let him know that he's in your hands, which are big and capable. And so thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Right. Thank you, buddy. We love you. Love you. <clears throat> and if I can bring us a little bit of the word today so we can start our time of worship together from John 14, a very familiar passage, John 14, 1 through 6 one that we might even have memorized. It says this, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? But Jesus said to him, and say it with me if you know it, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God bless the reading of his word. Neville, please come lead us in song. Good evening. Who is on the Lord's side? Oh, that's good show of hands. Well, we're going to sing that tonight. Uh, 674, 674. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the king? Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the king? Who will be his helpers all the lives to bring? Who will leave the world's side? Who will face the foe? Who is on the Lord's side? Who for him will go? By thy call of mercy, by thy grace divine, we are on the Lord's side, Savior, we are thine. This may be the conflict, strong may be the foe, but the King's own army none shall Round his standard retreat, victory is secure. For his truth unchanging makes the triumph for joyfully. singing. And we all know that Jesus is coming again, and uh, we have a message to give to other people, letting them know that he is coming again. That's uh, 753. I'm sorry I didn't give you the verses, but 753, 1 and 3 this time. Marvelous message we bring, glorious carol we sing, wonderful word of the King, Jesus is coming again, coming again, coming again. May 
our next song, What If It Were Today, 759, 759, verses 1 and 3. Jesus is coming to earth again, what if it were today? Coming in power and love to reign, what if it were today? Coming to claim his chosen bride, all the redeemer are glorified over the whole of scattered wide. What if it were today? Glory, glory, joy in my heart will bring. Glory, glory, when we will crown him king. Glory, glory, haste and prepare the way. Jesus will come someday. Faithful and true will find us there if it will share today. Watching in gladness and not in fear, what if it were today? Signs of his coming multiply. Morning light break the eastern sky. Watch for the time is drawing nigh. What if it were today? Glory, glory, joy in my heart to bring. Glory, glory, when we will crown him king. and prepare the way. Glory, glory, Jesus will come Good evening, everyone. Our um, prayer calendar is focusing on Chinese church. And if I may take a moment to share with you um, that uh, this past July 1st, the communist Chinese celebrated 100 years under communism. And what has that done to the people of China? 
uh, Bob Fu quoted the fact that about 8 million, 8, 8 million people were killed in communist China. Uh, a, more than 2 million unborn babies were killed under communism. And if you are interested in finding out, there is a podcast, Voice of the Martyr, interview Bob Fu. He is a Chinese lawyer, and he's an advocate for religious freedom. And he's a powerful voice to listen to uh, in terms because his own walk has testified to his faithfulness. Uh, the other thing he mentioned is that about 15, 20 years, there were already people talking about the vision of China being Christianized. And uh, in recent year, there is a secular university, Purdue. They made a study after carefully studying the stat inside China and the history of church growth. They predicted that by the year of 2030, they will be uh, 224 million believers, which would put it at 20 percent uh, of the population of China would be believers. So the idea of Christianized China is very plausible under that study. So I wanted to um, pray for those who are suffering um, in China. And I also wanted to use the verse that Dad gave last week from Matthew 21. I'll read it to you. It um, begins with 43. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing fruit. And who? And the one who falls on the stone, this stone that was talking in previous verse about the stone that the builder reject, but God has a, uh, had made him a cornerstone, the stone of Jesus Christ. And verse 44 say, and the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And when I was in um, Israel, they have an um, art exhibit that shows the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And at the beginning of this art exhibit, the artist uh, had a rendition of Jesus figure draped over this round stone as he conformed to the Father's will. And so the image of being broken when the stone uh, we fall on the stone like that, that figure of Jesus falling on the stone and conform to the Father's will. And that's what I want to pray for, uh, for the Chinese believer uh, during this time. So let's pray together, please. Father, we thank you for the power of your word. And even here, Matthew is quoted uh, something that is spoken by your prophet Isaiah. To many of us, this image of being uh, fall on the rock may not be clear. But I do pray, Father, that you make it clear to each one of us how when we fall on Jesus, uh, by the grace of God, our heart desire, our focus is conformed to his, as Jesus was conformed to the Father. I pray for the believer in China, Father, especially new believer with the persecution intensify with COVID and everything, more restriction, more watchful eye, and more uh, torture and imprisonment are happening today in China. But we believe that all things are possible, and even as a secular university predicted by 2030, that will be 224 million believers. We believe that you can do even greater because nothing is too hard for you. So I'm praying for the new believers and the believers who've been walking with you continue to fall on Jesus for their strength, for their hope, and also, Lord, that they continue to grow in conformity of Jesus Christ to be a powerful witness to their neighbors and even those who would persecute them. The, the dreadful thing of the rock crushing those who it falls on. We pray for your mercy for those who not yet believe and those who may have the heart set against Christianity for fear of losing power, for fear of losing whatsoever, Lord. Would you bring to their heart eternity, that indeed in their moment of grace they can turn to you, Lord. I pray for President Chi, and it says that if he wants to help with this growth in church, he would increase persecution. So we see, Lord, that you use persecution for church growth and for 
purify and sanctify your people in China. But we do pray for President Xi and the Communist Party. Lord, that there'll be a moment of revelation, that they see, Lord, what they trust on and lean on is but dust, but a vapor. It's here now and we'll be gone. So I'm asking for a visitation of Jesus Christ to this man, and we do pray for the turning of the heart of all those in China, that a Chinese, Christianized China would be possible even in our days. We pray this in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. On our sheet tonight, I have the Gaines girls. That's a good name for Carla and her daughter. And uh, so would you ladies please come? And they're going to play a duet. And then we, <laughs> mom's going to mess it up. And then, and then her beautiful daughter is going to play for us. So ladies, thank you for coming. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Olivia. We're always happy to have our young people come and play for us, right? Amen. Amen. Let's give another hand. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Somebody in hearing that I'm getting both knees operated on uh, wanted to know if I was going to have them done at the same time. And I said if I did, then I wouldn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> so... <laughs> So we're just going to do one at a time. Isn't it good to be together? I'll tell you what a joy it is to be together as God's family, to share in his music, to share in fellowship, to share in his love. What an absolute blessing. Would you kindly take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 22? Matthew chapter 22. You know, the greatest theme known to mankind is God's love for sinners. No other single theme has been discussed so widely, debated so strongly, written about so studiously, sung about so sweetly, or its believers persecuted so shamefully. 
That's the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's love for sinners like you and me. When we say John 3.16, we've said it so many times, I hope it does not lose its significance to us, where it took God's love sending his son, Christ Jesus, to pay the debt we owed but could never pay so that we might have a right relationship with him. For God so loved the world, so God so loved you, God so loved me, that he gave his only begotten, unique, one-of-a-kind son, the sinless for the sinful, that whoever believes in him, doesn't matter who we are, what we've done, whoever believes in him, hallelujah, should not perish, but have everlasting life. When we think of perishing, what a horrible thought. Perishing without God. We're going to talk about that tonight. And we're going to talk about a privilege and responsibility that you and I have in ministering to those who are perishing. And there are billions of them. Millions right here in the greater L.A. area are perishing because they do not know Christ as their Savior and Lord. Before our Savior went to the cross to die for the sins of the world, he preached this theme of God's love to the religious leaders of Israel and to the public at large. With the leaders, he was forceful and direct. Why? Because they didn't want to listen, and they didn't listen. With the multitudes, he was pleading. He beckoned them to come. With the outcasts, he was welcoming their sins need not keep them from accepting God's wonderful means of salvation. Once again, as we come to the parables, we realize that the time frame for especially the parable we're speaking tonight is the Jewish Passover. As they celebrate when the Jews were delivered by the power of God from the nation of Egypt, nobody could deliver them, but God could and God did. And so it was Passover season, but it was also Passion Week. And we mentioned last week, Passion Week is that week from Palm Sunday through the crucifixion and the resurrection when the Lord Jesus has his last days here on earth preaching the gospel, ministering to people. And so now as we come to another parable tonight, he's speaking once again to the religious leaders of Israel who have turned a deaf ear and a blind eye his way. Specifically, the day in Passion Week is Tuesday. It is our Lord's last public day of ministry. We believe Wednesday was a day of rest, what he spent with his family the, family, the family of God. And then Thursday, we know he met before the religious leaders of Israel. He was horribly beaten by them, and then from Rome. And then he was crucified on Friday. And by God's grace, on Sunday, our Savior rose again. Hallelujah, we serve a risen Savior. Well, leading up to this final, the final parables, our Lord has ridden into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on a donkey, not a charger, not a stallion. To ride into Jerusalem on a stallion would signal that he's coming to make war. But he rode on a donkey, that simple burden of beast, that beast of, who had a burden of, of all kinds, men and, and loads. He came peacefully to the people. He cleansed the temple for the second time, once at the beginning of his ministry and now at the last. And now he speaks to the leaders of Israel once again. And he gives to them five parables, five powerful parables, three of which run together. We have the parable of the two sons, and then we have the parable of the landowner, which we had last week. And now tonight, we have the parable of the marriage feast, a wonderful, wonderful celebration that will happen one day in God's time with God's people. And so I invite you to look with me, please, first of all tonight, Matthew 22, and I want to read verses 1 through 7 as we begin tonight. Matthew 22, verses 1 through 7. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, 
The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Would you please bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, as we come to you tonight, we again come to you with great thanksgiving. And we come to you in faith. This is not man's word that we are sharing. It is your word, the word of God, which is powerful, all powerful. It cannot be broken. It cannot be proven wrong. It is true. And so with great joy and great conviction and great thanksgiving, we bring your word tonight. Make it true to our hearts. We give you praise, Heavenly Father. We thank you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Chapter 21 closed with the religious leaders determining in their hearts that Jesus must die. And now as we move into chapter 22, the strong dialogue between our Lord and the leaders continues. The Lord Jesus is God. He is God the Son. He knows the hearts of people. He knows what they're thinking. He knows where they're going. He can speak as no one else can. And it was as if he's looking down into the hearts of these men. He's seen the resistance which they are giving to him though he is speaking the word of his Father. They, of course, do not believe that he's God the Son, their Messiah. Well, the answer that he gives to them, to their thoughts in this parable, continues the answer that he gave to them earlier. In verse 1, I want you to notice a particular word. It's a little word, but it is very important. It is the word again. You know, oftentimes we see a word and we think, well, there can't be much importance to it. It's small. It doesn't share anything that we are aware of that would be outstanding. But I want you to think with me. This little word indicates that our Lord is still addressing these people who are coming against him. He knows their hearts. He knows they have hatred. He knows that they want to put him to death. But he is coming to them again. With what? With the gospel of life. With the gospel of love. The gospel of truth. In these verses, they are questioning by what authority the Lord Jesus is speaking in Matthew 21 and 23. Well, at this point, he turns their question, over, their question back over on themselves. And now in the verses before us, he tells them where his authority comes from. By way of of a parable, the parable of the wedding feast. Verse 2, once again, please. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Obviously, the king is referring to God the Father, while his son refers to the Lord Jesus, who is God the Son. Please notice that our Lord here uses the expression kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God, as I made reference to last week. You see, the emphasis in this parable is upon the how and the why of this age rather than on the conclusion of the age as we saw last week. In Matthew 21, we had the parable of the landowner, and in Matthew 13, the parable of the sower. So the Lord Jesus is talking about the how and the why of what God is going to do if, by faith, they will take the Lord Jesus at his word. 
Here in Matthew 22, our Lord explains the how and why of the parable. He speaks of those who had been invited. You and I have been invited probably to many different things. Uh, Some of us were at a wedding this past Friday night. We were invited to a wedding feast, and we had a wonderful time with our friends. Now, who was invited to this wedding feast of whom our Lord speaks? He's speaking to the lost sheep of the nation of Israel. We know looking throughout the Old Testament, coming up into the New, God regarded his people as sheep. Sheep wander. You don't have to tell a sheep to get lost. They do it all on their own. And we are like sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray, the prophet Isaiah says. We have turned each one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The sheep of the nation of Israel, the people, have turned away from their shepherd, Almighty God. And now our Heavenly Father has sent his Son to bring these people back to him. And so the father sent some of his servants, as we read, to minister to them, but they still would not come. In the Old Testament, it was the prophets. In the New Testament, it's the apostles. The Lord Jesus sent out his apostles two by two, and in Luke chapter 10, he sent out 72 other witnesses to go out, to fan out into the area, and to proclaim the good news that the king is coming. Be prepared. Mostly, they did not listen. Now, as we look into verses 4 through 6, in his mercy, the father sent even more servants, but according to verse 5, they still paid no attention Think of it, the father had done everything for his people, but they chose not to come to him. We as parents know what it's like, or grandparents know what it's like when when we do things for our children or grandchildren, and it doesn't come out the way that we want it, and our, our hearts are aching. I bring this up only to say, can you imagine the heart of God aching for the lost? We forget that our God Our heavenly Father has a heart, and it breaks. It literally breaks for those who are lost and on their way to hell. It breaks because he knows there's no other way, and that's why he sent his son, the Lord Jesus. He gave to the nation of Israel his laws and his statutes. He provided forgiveness for their sins through the prescribed sacrifices. He sent godly men to minister his word to them, but they turned a deaf ear. They did not want to hear what God had to say. In essence, God was saying to them, Dear people, listen, I want to have fellowship with you. But they turned their backs upon him. Their response was indifferent. Other things were more important. And family, uh, they mistreated God's family, his servants. They killed them. This was Israel's rejection of God's gracious invitation. Oh, how God's heart ached for the crown of his creation. You know, we talk about many things being beautiful. Mountains, the oceans, valleys, trees. There's only one crown of God's creation, and that's humankind. That's us. We're the only ones that can have dialogue with him. We're the only ones that have God consciousness. We were created in his image. We are the crown of his creation. And that's why we mean so very much to him. In verse 7, he gives the father's answer to their rejection of him. Would you look with me, please, at verse 7? He says, the king, the king in the parable, was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. This was a prophetic statement that, of course, these people did not realize. A few short years later, in 70 A.D., Titus, the Roman, destroyed their city. It was burned burned to the ground. It was a prophetic statement that the Lord Jesus gave to them that day. But as we move on in this parable, we see that this rejection by the nation of Israel, 
the Jewish nation, made it possible for his invitation to be given to others, to Gentiles of all tribes, tongues, nations. And the glorious thing about heaven, there's no compartment for this nation and that nation or this church or that church. There was a story told of two churches, both on a corner, and one was singing, well, there be any stars in my crowns. And the church across the street sang, no, not one, no, not one. Poor people. They didn't realize that there's no Baptist, there's no Methodist, there's no Presbyterians in heaven. There's God's people through faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We are one in Jesus. Yes, what a wonderful, wonderful time this is that God has opened his salvation to all of us, to the blind and the lame of Israel, to those who were stricken with disease, lepers, to those who are trapped by scandalous sin, prostitutes and tax collectors, those from other nations, the Gentiles who the Jews called dogs, not worthy of God's love or forgiveness. Those that were bad and good, as stated in verse 8, were called. You and me, you and I, we were called. Would you turn to your neighbor and say, I'm thankful that we were called? Would you do that, please? I'm thankful that I was called. I'm thankful that you have been called by God. Well, I said last week the words of an old hymn, Whosoever will, whosoever will, send the proclamation over vale and hill. Tis the loving Father calls the wanderer home whosoever will may come. That's our song, your song, my song, whosoever will. This is the message which needs to be shared with others. You know, we think because we live in America that everybody automatically knows about God. May I share something with you? They do not. There are many who do not know about Christ Jesus, God's Son, I've mentioned to you our our granddaughter who who went to Cal State Dominguez. She's now doing her master's work elsewhere. She was in another church, went to a Bible study on Friday night, and she invited a girl from school to come with her to this wonderful time. And afterwards, she asked her friend, well, what did you think? What did you think of the Bible study tonight? And her comment to our granddaughter was, who is this Jesus? Jesus. This was 2019. This is educated America. And a beautiful young lady asked the question, who is Jesus? Dear people, our ministry in America is far from done. We have a long, long way to go in sharing God's word with others. The reason we need to share it is because there's no other way. John 1.12 tells us, but to all who did receive him, Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Now, some would call this the old-time religion. I call it the only religion. <laughs> this is the only gospel. The only gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then in verse 11, Matthew 22 We see that a problem has arisen. Would you look there with me, please? Verse 11, Matthew 22. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. Interesting. We must always remember that though God's call is to whosoever will, to all, People are in danger if they think that they can get to the banquet, if they think they can get to God's heaven on their own. They cannot. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father by what? But by him. But by him. Now, what was this man's problem? Well, in the parable, he lacked the proper wedding clothes, which the, which the king was offering Back in the day when they had a wedding feast, they would provide wedding garments so that all those who came would be dressed correctly. 
there would be nobody who would be out of dress. They would be dressed correctly. So if you didn't have on the wedding clothes that the physical king provided, you would be very much out of place. And so as the Lord Jesus mentioned this, they could see what he was saying. These wedding clothes, these, this wedding garment that the Lord Jesus is speaking of, though, speaks of the righteousness of Christ. You and I are sinners. Amen? We have no righteousness of our own. And if we are to go to heaven to God's wonderful wedding banquet, we have to have the clothes which he provides. And the clothes which he provides is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us, he who had no sin, Jesus, became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. To think that you and I, though we are sinners, and I don't have to look at you, all I have to do is look in the mirror. I know I'm a sinner. And to think that by God's great grace, he dresses me in the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as he looks at me, he doesn't see me and my sin. He sees the glorious righteousness of Christ. I'm dressed with the righteousness of Christ. He welcomes me. He welcomes you. What a wonderful Lord. What a wonderful message of salvation. Well, our world needs to hear of this. And that's where you and I come in. Would you keep your hand here at Matthew chapter 22 and turn to Romans 3, Romans chapter 3. And we want to look at Romans 3, verses 20 through 22. This is wonderful. Romans 3, 20 through 22. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of what? Sin. Now notice, please. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. God provides the, these righteous clothes, the righteousness of Jesus Christ to all who will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He dresses us in the righteousness of Christ. Yes, to attend God's banquet in heaven, to, to, to be there, everyone must be dressed in the righteousness of which can be provided only by our Savior, Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Well, now what happened to this man who came into the banquet, the wedding banquet, without the proper clothes? Thirdly, our passage of Scripture will tell us that those who are not dressed in the righteousness of Christ will be cast into outer darkness, into hell. Hell is not a word that people want to hear today, but may I share with you that it, God said the word first. It's a word that, that he gave that we might hear it, that we might beware of it, that we may not want to go anywhere near it and come to that other place, his glorious heaven, his glorious home. Would you now please look with me once again, verse 11, Matthew 22. And let's read through verse 14. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Did you notice that the king in the parable approached the man graciously and not in anger? What did the king call the man? He called him friend, friend. Oftentimes we hear that God is angry at sinners and he wants nothing to do with them. 
Nothing could be further from the truth. God loves sinners. He loves people like you and me. And the parable, friend, how did you come this way? He's he's graciously speaking to the person. And today God is pleading for sinners to come to him. But many like this man who came into the wedding banquet, according to the parable, are wanting to go to God on their own terms, in their own way. But it cannot be done. Well, if they're trying to get to God on their own, what do they need to hear? They need to hear the good news of salvation through faith in Christ. Who do they need to hear it from? Would you kindly now turn with me to Romans chapter 10? Romans chapter 10. And I want to read a very powerful passage of Scripture. Romans 10, beginning to read at verse 8 through verse 15. Paul says this, But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Saved. For with a heart one believes and is justified, and with a mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. I love this. Read it with me. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call, (coughs) excuse me, how will they then call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent as it is written? I love this too. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now we know it talks about preaching. And when we think of preaching, we think of just pastors or evangelists. But the application is to all who believe in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to ask you to take off your shoes and socks or stockings and to show me if you have beautiful feet. How many have beautiful feet tonight? I sure don't. Some of you do. You're blessed. (laughs) Know this. To the child of God who proclaims the word of God, salvation through faith in Christ, Almighty God says, you have beautiful feet. You say, really? Yeah, look at those buttes. <laughs> you have beautiful feet. You know, we tend to think that those who are preachers and pastors and evangelists and missionaries, they're the ones that are going to have all the people, all the rewards in heaven because of what they've done. But I'm convinced there's lots of little grandpas and grandmas who've been sharing the gospel of Christ with neighbors and family, who've been praying forever for them. I believe they're going to have some wonderful rewards in heaven because they've been faithful to the call of sharing the gospel of Christ with others. They indeed will have beautiful feet. Now, let me give you an example out of real life. You know that many uh, times it's been my privilege to go overseas and preach in India and Africa, Russia and elsewhere. It's been my privilege to do that. And I, I enjoy reading missionary stories. And one of the stories that I have just read and reread over probably 200 times at least is the life of Hudson Taylor who went to China in the late 1850s. He started what was then known as the China Inland Mission. And he went into the interior of China where nobody wanted to go, where even people, Christians, were not allowed. And he went with his men and his women, and they evangelized the interior of China. The Lord blessed. They lost many people through death, the Boxer Rebellion. Many of the China Inland missionaries and their children were brutally murdered, but the work continued on. 
The Lord took Hudson home before 1910. And then great things began to happen in China. By 1930, in the late 30s, early 40s, communism had really taken root. All of the missionaries were sent home from China. Nobody was left. They estimate that at that time there were 8 million Christians in all of that big land of China. But in 1970, when the door cracked open just a little bit so we could see what was going on in China, they estimated there were 40 to 50 million believers in Jesus in China. No missionaries, no American, no British pastors, just the Chinese people themselves. What had happened? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. These dear people caught the vision that if China was to be one to Christ, it would be through them. They didn't have to wait for the missionaries to return. God would do the work through them themselves. It was at great price. Many of them also were murdered, were put to death. But the Chinese have a name for Jesus, which I dearly love. I've never heard a name outside of God's word that means so much to me than the name the Chinese gave about Jesus. It is this, the nothing he cannot do one. The nothing he cannot do one. We say we can't witness for Christ because it's dangerous. Try living in China with communists. We say we can't do it because we'll be blacklisted. Try doing it in China with our brothers and sisters there. I can't do it. I do not have the ability to do it. No, you and I don't. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, he gives us the words and the way and the grace and the love to share the gospel of Christ. Today, the reason the gospel of Christ is going forth with power in China is because what was started a long, long time ago and continues today through the fourth and the fifth generation of dear, dear people like you and me who have dared to believe how beautiful are the feet of those who share the gospel, the good news. Dear people, do you and I have beautiful feet tonight? If we're sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with others, you have beautiful feet. I have beautiful feet. You don't have to be at on the street corner with a, with a megaphone. Just sharing from your heart with those the Lord leads into your path. But now we need to finish this parable. Would you look back with me, Matthew 22, verse, <clears throat> verse 14. The Lord Jesus goes on to say, For many are called, but few are chosen. The call spoken of in this parable is sometimes referred to as the general call. By that, it is a, it is a summons to a person repenting of their sin and proclaiming faith in Christ alone for the forgiveness of their sins. This call, this call of redemption, and repentance and faith in Christ is inherent in the gospel message. The word inherent means that which is permanent, essential, or characteristic, or a characteristic attribute. The general call of the gospel extends to all who hear the gospel. All who hear the gospel. This call is the great whosoever will of the gospel. Revelation 22, 17 says this, The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. How awesome that God gives us his salvation, not charging us anything. It did not cost us anything, but it cost Christ everything, his very life. Here then is the proper balance we find in, for many are called, 
but the few are chosen. The called, the called, all who hear, the called, all who hear, who reject God's invitation, do so willingly. And their, excuse, their exclusion from the kingdom, God's kingdom, is perfectly just. Why? Because mankind does not determine who gets in and who doesn't. Only God the Father determines who comes to his wedding banquet, who enjoys his heaven. God sets the condition of salvation, not man. Acts 4.12 tells us, this Jesus is a stone that was rejected by you, the builders, and of Israel, let me say that again, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, the rulers and elders of the people of Israel, which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other name. Well, those who heard but rejected, how sad. While those who respond to God's call are the chosen, what the word of God calls the elect. The chosen enter the kingdom of God only because of God's great grace. Aren't you thankful for his great grace? His great grace which chooses and draws them to himself. Dear family, this gospel of Christ continues to be preached today. And sadly, there are millions of people who continue to turn a deaf ear to the gospel. The call to salvation, forgiveness of sin, is in Christ. It needs to be shared. You and I are called by God to be the ones who share it. The privilege of the responsibility to share with others this message of Jesus is ours today. Will we do it? To say it another way, do you and I desire to have beautiful feet? The beautiful feet of the gospel. If you've never had the privilege of praying with someone to receive Christ, there is no there is no feeling on earth, no experience on earth which overshadows having the privilege to lead someone to Christ, to pray with someone to receive Christ. It's awesome. It's awesome. And dear family, we who know Christ as our Savior, we need to be humbling ourselves before him, and we need to be praying and looking for the opportunities that he would give to us that we might share of the wedding feast that is coming, this glorious recapturing of God's people into heaven, and we want people to be ready to meet him. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your parables. We thank you that they speak loudly and clearly to us. And Lord, we don't just want to hear, we want to do. Oh, Lord Jesus, may we not just be, not just be content to say, yes, I, I, I'm thankful for the message. I, I'm thankful for the way it spoke to my heart. May we go the next step, and as another song says, Lord, Lay some soul upon my heart. And love that soul through me. That I may do my part to win that soul for thee. We lead, you win. Lord, Lay some people on our heart tonight. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Please stand and we'll sing, Make, make Me a Servant, 669. 669. And of course, we'll be praying for you. So just know that, okay? I know you'll be supporting those who come. For those online, we pray that you'll continue to listen and to enjoy the messages and the fellowship of those who are here. Just want you to know we love you and we send God's blessings to you. Have a great week.